Ooh. I think Linda might have. Hi there. Um, thanks for having me. Um, I'm Linda Winton, the director of the Eagle Adult Education, and we are pretty big, actually, I believe, state in the uh, world. Um, and we cover Hollis or Buxton, mm -hmm. Hollis, Livingston, um, Standish, Steep Falls, Rye Island. Uh, so uh, there was of connectivity problems in our area and uh, need for device. So that's to see if we might be able to get some grant money to fund this for our community members. Thank you. Thanks, Linda. Um, and then I think we'll pass it to Jen. And then once you go, you can pass it to someone else. Hi, uh, Jen Alvino Wood. I'm the library director at the Wyndham Public Library. Um, was I supposed to be answering a question? I apologize. Oh, that's okay. Just or just, just tell why I'm here. Yeah, just sort of why you're here. Um, okay. Why it's really important to you? Okay. Um, uh, so broadband issues have always been a passion of mine, um, and I want to ensure that my library patrons in our community are um, connected and able to use um, devices and the technology that's available to them. So I will pass it to Tom, who is also in my community. Thank you. I'm sorry. I just literally tried to take a few bites of my lunch. I've been in meetings since 930 this morning. So um <clears throat> I'm the adult education director in RSU, RSU 14, which is Wyndham Raymond. And I work with Jen. And um, I guess the question was, why do, why am I here? Is there, um, well, um, we serve a lot of the, the populations that the digital equity plan is supposed to, you know, designed to serve. So we want to make sure that all of our students, all of our, all the people in the community have, uh, have, access the same you know equitable equitable back equitable access to um not only just the, the the hardware but just the 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 broadband itself so we're here to make sure that that uh, that happens as best as best we can make it happen and i'm gonna pass it on is linda gone yet we have gone okay um derek <laughs> thank you Hi, I'm uh, Derek Morin. I'm the contact center manager at the Opportunity Alliance and um, the program, the big program we run is 211 Maine. Um, so kind of wearing two hats here, one for the Opportunity Alliance, which is the CAP agency for Cumberland County. So we have 50 different programs here and um, involvement in this coalition to um, you know, raise awareness that uh, this work is going on for our own agency and the 50 programs here. And also for a lot of the callers that we get at 211, um, you know, lack of internet access is sometimes a secondary or a tertiary need of a lot of the callers that we get at 211, where, you know, they might need to apply for benefits, but, you know, they don't use email or, or uh, the internet or don't have a device. So, it does touch on quite a few of the um, the contacts that we um, are trying to manage here at 211 and at the Opportunity Alliance, and i um, glad to be here. And I'll pass it to Nathan. Hello all, uh, Nathan Davis, Director of Programs with Gateway Community Services. Uh, we have offices here in Portland um, and in Lewiston. Um, and uh, kind of work across uh, most immigrant, refugee, asylee, uh, BIPOC uh, communities uh, with kind of health, uh, community health outreach, uh, workforce navigation, youth homelessness outreach uh, for some of the shelter hotels. Um, and did some interviews with community members for the uh, uh, equity project. So uh, happy to be here and nice to meet you all. Oh, and I'll pass it to uh, Rob. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Rob Kleber with the Department of Labor, uh, manager of the Greater Portland and Springvale Career Centers. Uh, this certainly is a topic that uh, is important to us in terms of helping our our uh, our customer base, but whether it be employers or job seekers. And so, uh, 
being aware of what's what's moving forward, what the, having an impact on being at the table for what's uh, what initiatives might be able to be put in place to help our rural customers uh, any way we can. Um, happy to contribute to that discussion. So, I, fortunately, my schedule as of late has taken me away from the, these meetings. So, I'm anxious to get back to them and to see what's what's been going on. And I will uh, pass it over to Cordelia. Hello, I'm uh, Cordelia Hill, and I'm a resource specialist with Southern Maine Agency on Aging. Um, I don't think I have the agenda. Sorry, I'm coming in place of somebody else. Oh, so um, we'll send a link. I was at one of the first meetings, but um, I guess my role, um, I'm mostly helping people with resources over the phone and also helping people do applications for things like main care or SNAP. And a lot of times, um, you know, having an email address or internet is a barrier to online applications like Derek mentioned. Um, and then also, um, some of my colleagues are working on a social isolation. Isol I'm having a problem with isolation, feeling isolated uh, for older adults, and um, a new kind of study uh, where people are being given technology so that they can have um, you know one-on-one -on -one interactions with one of my coworkers. So um, social isolation, isolation, and also just connecting with resources, I guess, would be for me. Thanks, Cordelia. All right, and I'll pass it to Emily. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Emily. I'm the Community Engagement Manager at GPCOG, Greater Portland Council of Governments. It's good to see you all here. Um, we saw, I think, just Tom, was it, at our recent, um, did, at the Digital Equity Workshop a few weeks ago. So. It's good to see you all and um, looking forward to the conversation. Thanks, Emmy. Um, so today I wanna start off with just giving you all a brief overview of what is to come next now that we have submitted our first draft of the plan to the state. Um, I wanna take a little time to review um, the plan as a group, notably, um, trying to focus on the recommendations and goals section. Um, I think maybe we'll take a couple minutes to read that and then talk about it as a group, just to see if from the perspective of everyone we have here today, if there's any populations that we've missed um, or any um, sort of programming that you think could be added. Um, then I wanna talk a little bit about how we're gonna shift our focus to trying to increase um, enrollment in the affordable connectivity program. Um, and then we'll close with um, an upcoming opportunity um, to meet in person and talk about this issue. Um, does anyone have any questions or anything else that they want to talk about during this meeting? Are you referring to a specific page on this because it's like 50? Oh, yes, Linda. So um, the page that I'm referring to that's the solutions and recommendations is page... Um, it is page, um, let me see, I believe it's, yep, it's page 37, I believe is where it starts, 36. And Clara, you'd like to, <laughs> nine. you said in the agenda, because that's the, the most recent copy, I have the copy from the, um, the workshop in Belfast, but I know you made some changes to it, so you want us to use the one that you've. You yeah, if you could, okay. yep, yeah, if you could use the link in the agenda, that would be great. Um, I haven't really updated a lot to it. I think I just made a couple of shifts on coalition partners that we've added. Um, but the solutions and goals, recommendations and goals section will be the same on the paper copy you have, Tom, and the link. Um, so before we get into that, I just want to give um, a quick overview. So we've submitted our recommendations to the state a couple weeks ago, um, and they are working currently to incorporate all of the different regional plans into their statewide plan, um, which they will be releasing June 1st. Um, so once that plan comes out, then we'll have another opportunity for public comment. Um, so sort of the goal of keeping this group um, convening regularly 
um, is to make sure that we are all sort of in place for like when that next round of um, public comment and community engagement starts, which will be June 1st. Um, so that's sort of what's to come. And then the state will continue editing their plan until August 1st, which is when they'll submit that um, to the federal government. So the funding that comes with that implementation won't be available until 2025. However, uh, we will have another round of funding for this specific regional broadband partners program next year. Um, so the work that we are doing for this plan, the recommendations we have, what we're prioritizing um, will go into, some of that will go into the budget for next year. So we'll be able to start some programming um, in 2024. So just wanted to give that sort of general overview of like the next steps and like what to expect over the next few months. Um, but does anyone have any questions on that? Um, and Emmy, let me know if I missed anything. Okay. So I think maybe a good next step just to have some initial reactions to the digital equity draft plan um, is maybe give you guys the next 10 minutes to read over um, number nine um, and then come back together as a group and just hear your thoughts on if we're reaching all the populations, if this reflects um, the community engagement work that you all helped us perform and make sure that we're not missing anyone. Um, how does that sound to everyone? Does that sound good? Okay. Awesome. So we'll reconvene. Let's reconvene at 1225 um, to talk through this. So feel free to turn your cameras off and yeah, just take your time in reading it.
Sammy. Hi. Okay. Hopefully that was enough time. Yes, Cordelia, just nine. Give everyone a minute just to finish up reading. Um, any initial thoughts or reactions? Jen, I saw you shared a link in the chat. Um, yeah, it's, it's an article that just came to me recently. I shared it with some other um, town um, department heads because uh, we're working on building some outdoor spaces. And so it's, you know, a, a bench that's solar powered with internet mm -hmm. access and I just think they're really cool, yeah. when, you know. So when you're talking about increasing access, you know, mm -hmm. um, and if I'm reading this article right, they're not as expensive as I was anticipating. I think that so. would be interesting. Yeah, I feel like I've heard of these before. Yeah, that's really cool. So it looks like they cost six thousand dollars a piece, which I mean that's not pocket change. But yeah, not nothing. But it's not. You not know, bad. I was expecting like twenty grand for one. Yeah, no, yeah. I would, I would too. But, um, Claire, I have um a question. Is uh, right in the goal statements is develop and improve understanding across agencies. Blah 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 of how to make high quality and accessible digital mm -hmm. resources. Is it supposed to be, are they actually, to me that means like we're, we're creating them or is it supposed to be a, the word available at the end of that? Or is it supposed to be, how do we develop an understanding across agencies of how to make them available or are we actually creating them? Yeah, so this was something that came up when we talked about our vision statement of like one of the things that this group wanted to try to make happen was um, helping. So for example, like different town websites, like might not have different translation services or they might not have, they might not be accessible. So working with those organizations so that they understand like, and maybe that means like part of a, like something that comes out of this coalition is like a how-to on like making a really accessible website um, or like some sort of like things that we would hold as like a standard to websites so that people could really use them and like utilize. Um, so that was just sort of like an idea that came from that conversation. Um, okay. So it makes sense then you actually are want linked to, to design accessible mm -hmm. digital resources. Okay. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. Do you want um, like uh sort of editorial, like, you're missing a comma here kind of things. Yeah. Yeah. Anything. So I okay. currently have track changes on here. So any change you make, it'll like show oh, what the okay. change was. And then you can also like add comments if you, if we like misrepresented something, or if you just had like a general um, idea or felt like a certain program, like from your perspective, like a certain program idea, like might not work um, the way it's described. Linda? I just have a couple um, on the section addressing access to devices. Yeah, uh, it says work with the city of Portland. How about and beyond? Because some of us are not in the city of Portland, and we might have you know we have these needs. Yeah, um, most people think of Portland as being Cumberland County, but we're really you know spread out all over the place. And then um, mm -mm, it was something else. Give me a sec. Um, yeah, veterans, uh, the section on veterans, uh, partner with colleges and other educational institutions. I mean, I know uh, Tom and I, I know we both uh, serve veterans 
So, I mean, I didn't want to just specifically say adult education because there are other educational institutions in the area, but I think it should be more than just the colleges or the okay. community colleges. Yep. And um, I think that was it. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great, Linda. Claire, can I just suggest maybe we just go from the beginning of the document and work our way down through in case and just see if anyone has any comments about each individual section? Because I have some comments, yeah. but I don't want to just take us all over the place. Um, if would that makes sense to do it that way, just to work our way down. Yeah, no, I like that idea a lot, Tom. So um, yeah, that's a good idea to keep it structured. So the first section we talk about addressing access. So this is um, when it comes to just having um, available broadband. So this first one, individuals living in rural areas, like this is to actually expand the infrastructure. So working with towns that have broadband infrastructure projects um, to ensure that all of their community members have access to infrastructure. Um, and then the second one um, is more for all covered populations. One thing we heard a lot in the outreach was that people wanted more free public Wi-Fi um, in locations across the county and particularly in um more urban areas like Portland. So does anyone have any comments on the addressing access? And do you want us to use the a raise our hand? Do you want us to use a reaction, raise your hand? How do you want us to? Um, you can what just you want? Okay. You can just raise your hand. So um, Linda, I just, we're at the bring, top. Are those the only towns that are considered rural? I mean, is, are there, aren't there parts of Wyndham that are considered rural? I guess I want to make sure we're not missing any towns or are those ones that just have some current infrastructure projects going on or? Yeah, so these are towns that have current infrastructure projects okay. happening. So um continuing to support those projects, but okay. I'm open to suggestions on maybe changing the wording um to be more inclusive to other communities because I know that these aren't the only communities in our county that have connectivity issues. Mm -hmm. So open to ideas on that. Yeah, I was um, looking at that too and not wanting in a couple different spots, not wanting to pigeonhole or be too vague, I guess it could go both ways. But um, when I was reading that, I was just thinking something like, um, you know, the greater uh, Cumberland County and Lakes region areas and just kind of like mm -hmm. keep it vague. Um, <laughs> so we don't think we're, so it doesn't look like we're omitting certain towns. Like if somebody mm -hmm. reads it, they could take it very literally be like, oh, this doesn't include okay. pounds. Okay, mm -hmm. you know, um, but I don't know who's, you know, what, what the audience is either. So I don't want to get too granular or anything. So if I'm off base. Mm -mm. Um, no, I like that. Um, the other thing I was, I was kind of curious about was, and kind of going back to, I think it was Jen, you made the comment about the, or Linda was about the article that you just found with the public benches that have wi-fi in them i mean that's brilliant <laughs> love that uh and we're talking about bringing wi-fi to more public areas so my mind goes to well how how much funding are we talking about uh -huh. here like what is the potential like do we want to make recommendations and keep it th the recommendations that we have open enough to allow for something like that in in bridgeton or are we really talking about kind of like something a lot on a much smaller scale where we might have a little bit of money in each town to hire somebody to get them connected to existing resources? So I guess that's where I'm confused. So I don't know if I want to make these grand, you know, recommendations without knowing if it's even reasonable or feasible. And yeah. maybe I'm just you know, maybe I'm missing some stuff, but that's kind of where my mind's at is like, what are we, how much do we have to work with and before making a recommendation? Can I jump, can I jump in, Clara? Yep. Yeah. Um, what I would suggest is not worrying too much about the budget. If this is pie in the sky, it's pie in the sky. And I think we need to think really big. Um, it's easier to scale down than it is to scale up. So if we have not enough funding to do what we want to do, then you know how do we modify that to fit the budget? Um, it's but if we have those things written in the plan, um, then they'll at least be considered by the state. And we can also, you know, when we're asking for specific amounts from the state too, 
we might, the, the more we include in our plan and the more specific we can get, the more justification there is for why we need a certain number um, as far as budget goes. So um, think big, I would say. Yeah. I just want to echo that too. I think you, you better to have it in there. And then also, we, you know, as I heard you say that this is not, this won't be implemented until 2025. A lot can change mm -hmm. with technology mm -hmm. in the next one and a half years. So, you know, we, yeah. We, I think we do need to think big and then think about the possibilities. And I also understand that, Clara, you had mentioned at one point that this this is going to be a this will be a, a, a fluid document. It's not going to be set in stone, so you'll be able to go back and review it and make changes that you see um, that that when new needs arrive arise. Yeah. yeah, and one thing I'll add quickly um, as far as funding is. Um, we will get a certain pot of money from the state, but the state is also going around to a lot of foundations and other funding sources um, that I think will come in and help um, provide funding. I just spoke with someone the other day who um, Waterville has a model of they have free public Wi-Fi and it's sponsored through um, like universities. Uh, Colby, I think, helps sponsor it and other other funding sources like that that we could make some of this happen. Um, so I think with that, like free public Wi-Fi, like tapping into maybe like the Rue Institute or the University of Southern Maine um, as funding options or the Maine Community Foundation. So I think there are other, like Emily said, I think it's good to be sort of like pie in the sky because I think there will continue to be more funding um, as this becomes more of a priority in Maine. Um, I think I'll do, yeah, Cordelia, I saw your hand and then Nathan. I've just had kind of a similar question about, um, you know, how like the all covered populations where it lists the organizations that will have devices to loan out. And I just wondered how those were chosen or if maybe we could make it broader just so that other people could, other organizations could also be included. I just, one one that came to mind was the Portland Public Library, but I'm not sure if they've, since I haven't been in these, I'm not sure if they've been reached out to or, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a really good point, Cordelia. So this was based off of um, part of our stakeholder interview included, like, are you in need of devices? Um, and these are sort of the um, the ones who responded to our stakeholder interview who did say that they were in need of devices. Um, and I think based on like the time limit, we weren't able to hear from all, we did hear from all adult education organizations, but um, we weren't able to hear from all libraries, so maybe that should be like a priority um, for as we're updating the plan is ensuring that we hear from like maybe all libraries, like dedicate to saying, okay, we're going to hear from all the libraries, we're going to hear from all the adult education centers. Um, and if you have other ideas of like different anchor institutions, like schools maybe um, would be another one to, to reach out to. Um, and this, I don't want to confuse things, but I was speaking with someone the other day about how some other regional partners, instead of um, providing devices to organizations to lend out to folks, are creating like an application form um, where folks can like apply for a device and then that organization will supply the device for them. So like GBCOG would supply a device for an, on an individual level. Um, the reason we sort of thought about doing it more through organizations is because you have the connections to the covered populations, not us necessarily, um, but that form could be distributed through our coalition network. So just a lot to think about, but um, Cordelia, I agree. I think um, making this list more exhaustive, because I don't think this is, these are all the organizations in our county that would benefit from devices or that need devices. Um, I hope that was, that was helpful, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I'll make a note of that in, um, the addressing devices section. Okay, Nathan, pass it over to you. Yeah, I was just gonna, for like covered populations, locations for some of the accessibility, um, I think it is it is kind of in there, but not explicit. It's just around uh, either shelters, um, either uh, that being something that is looked at when setting up a shelter, for example, like the emergency shelter at the expo, having like, you know, digital uh, uh, services be available or just making that explicit. Um, 
and also thinking about uh, resource delivery and stuff like that for community members. If there is digital access, there might be a bit, uh, uh, ways for organizations to provide trainings, applications, as you were saying, everything like that through a digital format that's a little bit easier to uh, update uh, versus you know going in and having like um, uh, presentations and um, uh, open office hours and that kind of stuff. So just one uh, could give us a, another way of, of, of servicing community members um, as well. Um, but yeah, I just thought that making the, you know, I'm thinking about the expo, I'm thinking about the new shelter in South Portland, um, uh, maybe it being a, a requirement if a hotel is going to be a shelter location, even though most hotels are already equipped, just making sure that that is there um, explicitly. So uh, those are just a couple of uh, comments I had on the buy, yeah. buy hotspots piece. Yeah, Nathan, I think that's a really, a really good point. I added that um, under the providing free Wi-Fi um, for public locations. But I think, so number nine is like our specific recommendations and goals for our region, but there's also a section underneath um, that's uh, strategies implemented on the state level. So I've been thinking like, as we've done this work, I talked with Abby from the Portland Adult Education um, center and she talked a lot about how like the Preble Street Teen Center doesn't have internet and like certain shelters don't and like maybe trying to influence like a statewide um, network for social service locations similarly to how the main state library network works um, like that could be something that we recommend to the state that they like investigate that um, on a state level and try to mandate it yeah um, okay, I'll pass it to Rob. Just in terms of uh, a reflection on um, the list of agencies, are, would you be the point person, Kara, in terms of this making updates to this list, or is it ongoing? Or are we putting a timeline on how to best to accrue this? Um, one population that stands out to me is the the senior population and the uh, senior community service employment program, SECEP, uh, serves specifically Cumberland. And I'm trying to think the other one is Franklin. So it's very yeah. specific to our region. Other uh, counties throughout the state is A4TD, mm -hmm. touches base on those. So even looking at York, even though the counties are right next to each other, through the Department of Labor, this is a program through the Department of Labor. And uh, so that we'd have to decipher between uh, that, those two very similar programs serving a similar population, um, but focusing on very different regions. So uh, okay. I just wanted to highlight that. Uh, but if, if ideas such as that are coming in, would you be the point person to make those types of updates? Yeah, so this document is like you're fully with this link, you have full editing access. So um, if you like look at this list and are like, oh, this organization is missing, um, please feel free to like put a comment in um, or like if you enter it in, it will show up as like an edit. So I'll still be able to say, OK, this is new and like this is an organization we should reach out to. Um, I I think we should try to. Um, so the state plan will be published in June, um, June 1st. And so I'll be interested to see how they incorporate this and how specific they get to which, like what list of organizations in our county are in need of devices. Um, but I think maybe by July 1st, having like a pretty solid list um, just to ensure that the state has time to incorporate it um, if they're planning to get that granular with the statewide plan. Uh, making sure they have time to incorporate that by the August 1st deadline. Um, but again, I will say, so this plan um, is going to be incorporated into the statewide plan, sent to the federal government to access the implementation funds. But once we draw down those funds, we'll be able to like take out the Cumberland County plan again and like continue editing it. Um, so it is like very much like living, breathing document for the entire like five year implementation stage. Um, 
So that helps. But I, I do think that that's a good idea to have a deadline and, and I'll follow up via email um, to confirm this. But I think by July 1st, having a pretty solid list would be a good, good goal to have. Um, Cordelia. My uh, question was kind of about the organizations too. Um, I'm like, can we just add any that we kind of think would be good to be added on, or is there like a any kind of limitations to who we could put on there? <laughs> no, I would say just anyone that you can think of, um, and we can continue sort of connecting with them, doing outreach, um, and again, like maybe they end up becoming a part of the coalition. And I think the coalition is sort of just something that we're going to continue to grow over time um, and draw upon. But so I would say no limit. I think whoever, whatever organization you think of, um, just feel free to put it right in there and we can um, maybe like at the next coalition meeting, we'll take some time to review um, the organizations that are on that list. I'll have time to reach out to them. I might ask some of you if you um, put the name there um, for a contact there or to connect me to someone there. But yeah, I would say. Thanks. Feel free to put as many as you want. Okay. So when we make edits and changes to this, I mean, are we gonna, are we kind of expected to go in on a regular basis to see what's been what's been updated, what's been changed, or how do you want? I I'm a little leery to make all these edits. Um, being new to this, new to the committee, new to this group, and I mean, I. I have my opinions. We all have, and I just don't want it to be seem like that. I'm just, you know, foisting this on some, I'm just doing this without having a conversation about it. So I'm a little leery about that. Yeah. So, so I would say in that case, if you ever feel like there's something that you're going to edit that you're unsure if like you actually want to make a change to, um, I would just say use the comment feature and maybe just highlight the section that you're talking about. Just leave like a comment and then I okay. think at our next meeting, once we have a couple of weeks to like go in and make all those comments, we'll have okay. a period okay. of time at the next coalition meeting to like discuss those comments and sort of have more of a conversation about it without, um, if you're unsure about making a direct edit. But again, yeah. like all the edits are tracked. So anything you edit, like we'll be able to review um, okay. regardless. So yeah, don't worry about like making a change and thinking it's gonna like, like messing up because yeah we'll yeah. be able to track every change that's okay made. um yep yeah yeah i have some other suggestions but i know it's it's later and it's you know towards the end of section nine so i'll just wait wait until we get to that area yeah okay so i think we'll move on to addressing affordability um so sort of the main two things that we have in this section are um increasing enrollment in the affordable connectivity program. Um, I believe only 39% of eligible households in the county are signed up. Um, so there are definitely a lot more people that could take advantage of it. Um, and then the other was figuring out a way to provide free unlimited internet access for asylum seekers um, who often have to wait to get their work permits and don't have a source of income to pay for um, internet access. So any thoughts on this section? Um, Oh, edit to welcome. Looks good. I guess not to not to call you out, Nathan, but I guess I'd be curious from like your perspective of working with asylum seekers, like if you think that this is something that's needed, like the free, having free unlimited internet access and like if there would be like barriers to getting that to asylum seekers or if there are like other resources that are needed to like actually have a program like that work, I guess. Yeah, I'm just curious if you have any like initial thoughts. Yeah, I was actually thinking about, uh, I was trying to find the space where, uh, there's kind of two parts of the same the space where we're talking about navigators. Um, I think it's further on, further on along, but, um, <clears throat> There is a, um, I'm going to loop back to your question, but there's okay. the navigator um, piece, which I think is kind of important for not only uh, doing information and skill building with community members, but information and skill building with um, uh, uh, population serving organizations as well. So the folks who are, are, who are working with um, community members on a day-to-day -day basis are also well-equipped 
to have some type of digital knowledge. Um, so I think there's kind of a two, two pieces to that. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's for, you know, a wide variety of populations there. I think it would be super helpful. Um, but the other thing I was thinking about is particularly with programs like this, having a face to it is, is so important, particularly when it comes to um, a lot of the communities that we serve, just because even from like a healthcare perspective, folks are consistently coming back to the same person that they've built a relationship previously. Um, and it's, it's, it's important to have that in place. So there's a trusting relationship there. Typically somebody, you know, who hopefully speaks, uh, if not your direct uh, native language, uh, a, a similar language as well, um, that can help you kind of navigate those those spaces because it's it's one thing to say, and I saw it earlier in, in, in there, is like going through a whole application process and getting it connected to your own, you know, digital service provider is pretty difficult. Um, and so yeah. you need kind of a trusted advisor and making your way through that process to have access to the services that the state is trying its hardest to provide to people to have access. Um, so yeah, I think that's, hopefully that looped back to your question, but that's kind of. Yeah, um, yeah it definitely does. Yeah, I think, cause I think in this, like there would be funded needed to create like sort of our own more local subsidy, similar to the affordable connectivity program, um, which asylum seekers oftentimes can't sign up for because identification is needed and they don't have any form of identification. Um, so this would be sort of essentially creating like our own subsidy like that for internet. Um, so I think your answer, Nathan, helped because it made me realize we don't just need the funding for that subsidy, but like also funding or some sort of programming to like train um, like staff at organizations or like community members to help people sign up for this type of like subsidy. And just to build on that uh, briefly, there's also, I think, a level of uh, needing to know, because it's not going to be perfect right out the right out the gate and understanding where the um, uh, the issues lay and having advocacy around that. I think one prime example of that is like we're doing some pre-apprenticeship programming right now and folks um, need to go to GA in the middle of the day, even though they're in a pre-apprenticeship, you know, pathway to getting into a job. Um, yeah. So things like that will happen that don't necessarily need to happen, but might happen in this program, you know, uh, specifically yep. as well. So. Yep. Yeah, no, that's good to keep in mind. And that, um, I don't know that we'll have, we're actually running <laughs> sort of short on time. This time has gone by really fast, but um, I did want to talk a little bit um, at the end, we might have to push this to the next meeting, but about like, which, if we do a sort of like train the trainer program of like, um, helping uh, organizational representatives get people signed up for the affordable connectivity program? Like where should we be focusing? Like, is it people who help folks sign up for the GA? And like, is that a part, should we have that be like a part of that process, um, caseworkers, stuff like that. So something to think about. Um, any other thoughts on addressing affordability, Cordelia? Sorry, um, I just had one more comment about the affordable connectivity program. Mm -hmm. And just in my experience, trying to help people to sign up for it. Um, you know, a lot of people or many people who have helped do it don't have an email address. Um, and there's a recommendation that we help them to create an email address, um, which is kind of I'm a little leery of doing that just because you're sort of creating an email address for someone and then you know, will they be able to actually access it later on? And mm -hmm. so I've been doing a lot of paper applications for it. <laughs> um, okay. But anyway, just so just that one kind of barrier, the having to have an email address to actually access, um, you know, the e most easily access the affordable connectivity program can be a challenge. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's really good to think about and something that we can add. There's a section on... It's a long, it's a long plan, but there is a section about like barriers to federal programs. And I think that's definitely one that we can include there and try to figure out how to problem solve around. Okay, so next we can talk about addressing access to devices. Um, so this includes trying to provide devices for asylum seekers, refugees, and immigrants. So working with 
um, organizations that already serve these communities to um, help support their device lending, current device lending programs, get them more devices if they need. Um, uh, we haven't spoke with a couple H friendly communities that have a tablet lending program um, in places like Dexter and Saco. So trying to replicate that in communities in Cumberland County, um, providing devices to different locations, um, helping to fund staff to track those devices. Um, and then lastly, we spoke with someone who represents uh, minority owned small businesses. Um, and he thought that it would be useful to have some sort of subsidy um, to help them pay for internet devices, translation services um, in getting started. So any thoughts on this section? Right. And again, you can go in and edit at any time and um, that'll be reflected to other people as like an edit that we can track. So we do that. Tom, did you have something? No, I, I'm just, I was putting some comments in to the side. That's all just looking oh. at where you're going to house some of these lending programs, you know, whether it needs to be you know, in, in, in multiple locations or can it be in one, you know, or a couple rather than having it spread out over every different type of agency. I think it might be uh, kind of unwielding. So yeah, yep. yeah, that's an interesting idea. Of I know that um, the adult education centers mm -hmm. have like their hubs, so that could be like a centralized device lending program. Um, I don't know. I'm curious, like um, Nathan, Rob, Derek, if like there are any like if you would benefit from like like needing devices, but also like wanting that sort of like tracking and like that side of things to be housed outside of your organization or if you would rather have it internal curious yeah yeah i was just kind of thinking about that too like one of the things i was going to mention is just to have like a one uh, one platform where everybody that's either lending or providing technical assistance or helping somebody apply it's all in one spot mm -hmm. um when covid hit you know we had to lend out um to go have everybody go go home so there were laptops it was laptop number da da da, da headset number da 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 and it, and then a month later after the dust settled it's like okay where's this device where's that and it was impossible to track because we didn't have anything i had a piece of paper yeah um so and i think that that would be important to have a central um spot for everybody who's touching this program and involved can see what's going on with each applicant or or um, area uh, that's that's helping out or or you know location that's that's there to to assist with somebody. So I can see yep. people moving around um, and needing help in certain spots and and kind of it would be nice to be able to look up somebody's record, I guess. Yeah, it also might help to deal with maybe someone who might be, be going from place to place to place to try to get multiple <laughs> devices. Right. You know, why do right. you, so, or, so just keeping track of that in the, in the, in the greater area, I think um, would be helpful. Yeah. Yeah. We have a hard time tracking them down when people take them out. So yeah, I mean, we could use some assistance with, with that because they, then they do move, mm -hmm. but they might move to another community within this service area. It'd yeah. be nice to know, you know, where those people are and where the devices are. And for reporting too, just to be able uh -huh. to say everything's going into one spot and then we can look back two years in the into the past and say, this is what we've done. Uh -huh. And we're all feeding the same. Um, yeah. I think that in my mind, I go to the place of like what's already in place in the library system is Minerva with the you know book sharing and kind of resource sharing that way if there a way to take an existing system that's already working well and enhance it more and include not just book sharing but also device sharing and it, it, it's, it's already kind of that infrastructure of communications and tracking is already there so that's where my mind goes yeah yeah I'll pass it to Linda and then I want to hear from Jen on like the library lending 
programs? That um, we, well, in our program at Tom's, I'm sure, um, we keep track on an Excel sheet who takes it and, you know, who, and they bring it, we're, we're pretty lucky so far and they bring them back uh, unless they move out of the district or something like that, we can't trace them. But I think um, for lending purposes, maybe you can go by, I'm just using this as an idea, by school district, you know, because um, his school district would take care of Wyndham Raymond, why would take care of the five count or whatever, the cities that we serve, et cetera. And that, and then maybe we can have a central place where we record this as well, not only on our site, but record it as well, because um, I don't think having one central place for the whole area would be workable. I mean, cause it's huge, you know, it's a huge geographic area. So maybe go by district, uh, by town or whatever you wanna, you wanna, you wanna do. Just a thought. Districts uh, encompass more than one town. So that might be a good idea. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, I like the idea of school district, Linda, like a pre-existing region. Um, just just a quick comment on that is um, not only the system, but the like giving organizations or places the how to like how like what's the process you should use when logging out a device and getting it in there. <laughs> because we do, we had something similar with iPads for our youth mentoring program. And like we tried to use a system, but it wasn't uniform nor like well informed. Yeah. Um, so just a, uh, the how to, I think is also important. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a really good point. Um, mm -hmm. Jen, did you want to talk a little bit about, I know we are a little over time so we can wrap after this, but I want to hear. Yeah. So, I mean, just briefly, I mean, each, each town in Cumberland County has, has a library and most of us are connected through a software system, um, and there is a delivery service, um, van delivery service that we all use to get items around the state. So um, there's definitely opportunity for partnership. I think there'd have to be conversations with uh, both our state library um, who manages the contract for uh, the van delivery, um, but you know, every library, if somebody walks in and needs help with a device, there's going to be people there that will help them. So, you know, I think having having the devices or at least some of them housed at, you know, local libraries is there's opportunity there um, and staffing to help facilitate it. Um, and, you know, in terms of tracking lending, our software already does that. Um, people would need to get a library card, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, the only thing I would say that we um, lack is um, a, a heavier hand when something goes missing. So, mm -hmm. you know, people check out things all the time from us and we never see them again. Um, there are some libraries that that do things like, you know, work with their police departments or work with, um, you know, collection agencies or things like that. But it's dependent on each individual community, how they handle um, when things don't come back. You know, we all have a system of, well, we'll send you a letter, we'll send you a second letter, we'll send yeah. you a bill. But, you know, I, I think, and oftentimes with different um, populations of people, you know, if you have, you know, a person that's unhoused and, you know, they're moving to different communities, um, that's going to be hard to to track that person. Um, so you know, there's there's definitely some some opportunities that we could build on, um, but some uh, deficiencies as well that we'd want to keep in mind. So, yeah. but I think it, it would be really cool to utilize the libraries in the area. I don't want to speak for anybody else, but Wyndham would would be interested. Yeah. So. No, that's awesome, Jen. And I know we're we're trying to organize sort of like a Emmy and I have talked a little bit about organizing like a round table with just all the librarians in the county um yeah. get everyone into the same room and 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I could get some key people like names for you. I mean, I'm on the, the Minerva board um, okay. as well. Um, and Minerva serves, there's like 60 libraries across the state um, that are involved in that consortium, but then there's a few other smaller consortiums as well. So, yeah. and, the, and they include um, the academic libraries that, you know, the bigger academic institutions and things like that so yeah yeah that would be great thank you jen um go to rob well this has been a good conversation that sparked my thinking on okay in a, in a lending program and not true ownership who owns the uh support and maintenance of the devices mm -hmm. i've had the benefit of working in the middle school when the laptop program rolled out. And that was a, a learning curve, sharp learning curve during that time of, okay, there things go south with technology devices and who is going to be responsible for that? And what system is in place to, once again, either deliver, travel, collect, redistribute, all of that. Um, is yeah. another piece to consider so anyway just not to be the, the rain cloud but to just kind of <laughs> address that piece no that's it's good to think about these things beforehand while we're still making the budget and hi nathan thank you for joining us um but it, it just brings to light to me though that how hard it is for us to try to manage that when we have you know when we're, we're all understaffed yeah so if we could have someone that's, design, that's designated to do this and help us you know, yeah. we do bring the we do ask the students to bring the devices back for updates and repairs, but <laughs> they've got to get them here. Then they're going to come back and pick them up. And then we know that there's challenges with transportation and work schedules and everything else too. So there's a lot, lots of um, lots of moving parts, lots of challenges. Yeah, I to think about. Okay, um, I think we'll wrap up. We went a little over time, but I appreciate everyone's thoughts. This has been really, really informative. Um, so I would. Uh, encourage you to keep making edits in the document um, at our next meeting, which is three weeks from now. Um, we'll spend sort of that first half going through any comments that people made, um, sort of figuring out how we're going to edit things. Um, and hopefully we'll get like a different group of people next time to hear their opinions. Um, I'll send a follow-up email with a recording of this though. So those who weren't able to make it can catch up. Um, Yes, Tom. Just well, I know on your agenda you said coffee with Cog, and you had a oh. date to be date to be announced. I know Thank that you, our, Tom. I almost forgot about that. Yeah, yeah, we're, all getting, so, we're all getting booked up pretty solid here, so I just wanted yeah, to get a date in mind. Too? Yeah. So our next meeting. Um, let me double check. Um, our next meeting as a coalition is um, June eighth. Um, <sighs> same time, so it's a Thursday at noon. Um, mm. Coffee with Cog. This is a public forum that GP Cog runs to just bring community members in and have a few panelists um, talking about issues in the region. Um, so this next one is going to be focused on digital equity. Um, so we're going to have some coalition members um, sort of speak during that. It's going to be um, the second, sometime the second week of June. We're still finalizing a date, um, but as soon as I know the date, I'll send it out to you, um, and that'll be at. Um, our conference room at GB Cog. Um, and I will send out more details about that. Um, yep, yeah, and we can put a hold on your calendar once we have that date. Um, Cause it, it would be great to sort of have an opportunity to see each other in person. But um, if you, if something else comes up and you can't make it, that's totally fine. We just wanted to extend the invitation. All right, any last thoughts before we, before we end this meeting? everyone feel good awesome well thank you so much um thank and you. I hope you have a great rest of your week thank you you too, you too. have Stay a good warm. weekend <laughs> and a good weekend bye bye now